It's Good Friday, and I can't think of a better place to spend this day, to spend Easter, and to wrap up our very first week of the Stackelbeck Tonight Show than right here in the city where it all went down, Jerusalem. This is the place where Jesus was crucified, died, buried, and rose again. And the Mount of Olives, where I am standing right now, is obviously a very pivotal place in the ministry of Jesus in the gospel story. He only ascended to heaven from this very spot, so a very special place. And we're joined tonight by a very special guest, our good friend, the one and only Danny the Digger Herman, Israeli tour guide, archaeologist, and a good friend of this show. Hey, my friend, number one, happy Easter. Happy Easter. What an honor to be on your show again. What an honor to have you on this day of all days. And number two, Danny, okay, we have probably the most majestic overlook of the city of Jerusalem that there is right here in the Mount of Olives. But what did Jesus see? What would a pilgrim to this city have seen on Good Friday 2,000 years ago from this vantage point? First of all, he would not see any Muslim shrines. He would see a big white edifice, the temple in full glory, where Jewish pilgrims would be coming during the high holidays to offer sacrifices, mostly pigeons, and also to give in a contribution, a financial contribution of half a shekel per adult male every year. And the city itself was three times bigger than what the city was today in Gulf. Okay, it was a much bigger, more prosperous city. And at the western end stood Herod's temple in full glory. Yeah, this was known as the second temple, Danny. And look, we have the Dome of the Rock. By the way, folks, you can hear the Muslim call to prayer right now. This is Jerusalem and many faiths are here. But Danny, as you said 2,000 years ago, the Dome of the Rock, the Al-Aqsa Mosque, which are the shrines right now atop the Temple Mount, they weren't there. It was Herod's temple, the second temple, and it was a massive structure. And by the way, Jesus taught in that temple, chased out the money changers, and he and the disciples spent a great deal of time there. In the spring of year 33 or so, that's the traditional count, uh, he would spend here one week, and that will be the last week of his earthly life here. That's right. As you again, folks, hear the sounds of Jerusalem in the background, let's go to that week. He comes into the city on Palm Sunday, Hosanna, fast forward to the Last Supper, and then this day, Good Friday, and the events of this day. Take us through that a bit. He is captured by the messengers of the high priest. He's interrogated by him in the Sanhedrin, and then handed over to Pilatus. Pontius Pilate, the governor of, of this region. Condemned to death, he is taking the tool of his punishment, the tool that will cause his death. He's carrying the cross to the site of the Golgotha. That's the name of the place of the execution, which is said to be outside the city. The place of the skull. After he is dead, he is buried in a tomb which is nearby. This is more or less what the New Testament tells us. And 300 years later, that site is identified verified by Queen Helena. And once it is legitimized, the whole space here turns from a Roman pagan city to a very Christian city. You mentioned the spot that Helena in her travels in the Holy Land identified as what she believed and what many archeologists like yourself and many others believe is the very place that Jesus again was crucified, died, buried and resurrected. We're going to go there right now, Danny. It's called the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. It's probably the most iconic site in all of Christianity. It draws millions of Christian pilgrims from all over the world on an annual basis, all eager to touch, to see, to be in the presence of the Golgotha and the tomb. Well, folks, it is very chilly here atop the Mount of Olives, so we are going to take you right now, again, to the very place where many believe the Easter story took place the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in the old city, the Christian quarter of Jerusalem. That's next. Welcome back to a very special Easter edition of Stackelbeck Tonight. This is one of probably the most actually significant sites in all of Christianity. We are standing outside the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in the old city of Jerusalem, and we are standing with 
the one and only Danny the Digger Herman. Danny, quite possibly, according to many, the very site where Jesus was crucified, died, buried, and rose again. Nothing compares to this site, which is venerated since the fourth century, since the identification or the verification made by Queen Helena. Her son then built a magnificent church over it. It has been modified many times since, like this entrance is a result of the Crusaders' restoration. But inside, you still have those two pivotal spots, the Golgotha and the tomb. The tomb of Jesus and one of the most visited sites in, in all the world and an amazing, amazing place that you're about to take us into right now. Let's take a look. The way. Absolutely amazing, number one, where we are. And number two, that we had special permits granted to us to film here. Hey, this would usually be a mass of people packed to the gills, but we have it to ourselves today, and this is a very special place. Tell us why. The site over here is identified since the fourth century as the Golgotha, Skull Hill, Calvary. The place of the skull. The place of the crucifixion of Jesus. When Queen Helena Augusta came here and the local Bishop Macarius showed her this place, it was authorized by her. And then Constantine made this big church over it, venerated to this day. Lay out what this would have looked like 2,000 years ago at the time of the crucifixion. You need to remove the whole building, all of this decoration. You are standing inside a garden and then a high hill, which can still be seen. Come, let's take a closer look here. You can see the exposed rock behind the glass. People see the cross here, the kind of reenactment, but they're pretty positive that this was about the positioning no, of no, the cross. not about. This is it. This is the very spot because here you have the rock and here in the middle, you see this silver frame. Yeah. If you put your hand there, Eric, there's a big indentation like a hole which goes into the rock. This, by Christian faith, is the very place where the vertical cross was placed, was positioned, and the crucifixion was right above. It seems that most archaeologists believe that this is the spot where the crucifixion took place. Why do they believe that? And do you believe this is a very credible spot where it may have actually happened? It's a very good candidate for the following reasons. A. It's a high hill. Any event happening here, the whole city will see it. And Romans wanted to punish people that were punishable in the most public way, so everyone else will be terrified and, and disciplined. This is a good place to do so. Everyone will see it, everyone will be terrified. No one will steal, and I'm reminding you, two thieves were crucified next to him. No one will claim he is the Messiah. It's bedrock. It's always been here. Rock doesn't grow. If it's here today, it was here 2,000 years ago, but street level was probably lower. So this is a good spot, again, to execute anyone in, a, in the most public way. Jews always, in all periods, always buried their dead outside the city. And this is so close to it, so it has to be also outside the city. And the New Testament tells us that the crucifixion was outside the city. Archaeologically, we haven't proven where the city wall is. It's buried somewhere in this area, but this was already external. So the circumstantial evidence is very supportive of the assumption that this is it. What do you feel? Why is this building a special place for you? You don't have to be a believer and you're just so moved by it. I see people carried, you know, coming in wheelchairs and, and brought up here and put on the stone of unction. I see children, babies placed on it, people crying, people, you know, touching, kissing and, and lighting candles. This site is just so spiritual. Now, Danny, this obviously is a place of great significance for all Christians. May very well have been the spot of Golgotha, but where we are going next here in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre is really what it's all about, the culmination, the tomb of Jesus, where he didn't stay very long. The empty tomb, yes, which according to the Gospel of John was nearby. It doesn't give us a distance, but nearby means it has to be, you know, close around here, and indeed, a first century tomb is right here around the corner. Lead the way. 
Let me show you. This is probably the most foot trafficked site in all of Christianity, not only in Jerusalem, but throughout the world. This is the place that many believe was the very site of the tomb of Jesus. The site of his burial and resurrection. Yes. It's the empty tomb that makes it so important. Okay, we know the biblical story. Three days, Jesus rose again. But give us some backdrop of the site itself. The site of the crucifixion is a big natural hill of bedrock. It's always been there. And then, as an archaeologist, I can tell you that this tomb is typical to the first century. The tomb was new. And indeed, this tomb has only one ledge to put one body in, meaning it was just created. It wasn't enlarged yet for a whole family, as you usually see in tombs. On the following Sunday, the tomb was empty from the body of Christ, but wasn't completely empty. There was an angel sitting inside telling them why it's empty because he rose from the dead. And he tells us that he was sitting on the right side. And the ledge is on the right side. So again and again and again, when you examine this place, it fits the criteria. You'll see people all around us here. I think the response certainly speaks to that. Now we're able to go inside and actually take a look, which folks is always a very rare treat to have it so private right now, without a doubt. Danny, can you lead the way yeah, inside the very spot? Crowded. Let's do it. Look at the shape of this tomb, Eric. It, it has only one place to put one body, one ledge here on the right side. As the text tells us, it should have been on the right side. And a very important note, now it's all covered with marble and decoration. But just a few years ago, they did renovations and a very, very moving moment was when they moved the marble to see is there bedrock behind it? Or maybe it's just all built up. There was, there was bedrock and one can still see it right here. And again, this dates back to the first the century. The first century. This the time is of Jesus. a first century tomb cut into the rock to bury one person, just as the text tells us. This may very well have been the place yes. where the Lord not only was buried, but rose again. And, and Danny, what does it say right here? Christos Anesti. Christ has risen. Every Greek Christian that comes here will say, Christos Anesti, Aletos Anesti. Christ has risen. Indeed, he has risen. Danny, this was an incredible, incredible privilege this Easter to be here with you. Thank you so much for being our guide in this most special of places, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. I just need a moment right now, if you don't mind, yeah. to take this all in. Welcome back to this special Easter edition of Stackelbeck tonight. Folks, we just took you to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in the old city of Jerusalem, the place that many believe, including archeologists, historians, that the crucifixion, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus took place. But where we are at right now is a very special place for me and for believers around the world. This is the Garden Tomb. And we're joined by a very special friend, our good friend, Reuben Daron. Reuben, always great to see you, my friend. Wonderful to have you here. Eddie. Happy Easter, brother, first yes, of all. Yes, indeed. And secondly, the Garden Tomb. Tell us a bit about this place, why it's so important, what, what it means to you. As you've said, archaeologically, it is probably the other location in the old city still, which at the time was outside of the city walls. 
but they crafted a garden. There's a cistern with water. There's a second temple era Jewish burial grounds. There's an ancient garden. Everything that is described in the scriptures is here on display for people of faith. This is a place where born again believers, followers of Jesus from throughout the world come every year. And really, Reuven, I think you can feel the Holy Spirit in this place, the you peace do, of God. But the presence of the Lord is here. Yeah. So it's a place of worship. It's a place of Bible study. It's a place of fellowship to break the bread drink the cup, and connect with our Lord one more time. And we are going to do that together. We're going to get a look at the tomb. Reuben, lead the way. Let's do it. Let's take a look. This, at least for me, is always kind of what I pictured. I picture the tomb of Jesus just in my mind's eye. And here we are at the garden tomb in Jerusalem. You and I were talking a bit off the camera about the burial rites and how things were uh, when a Jew died during the time of Jesus. How did that all go? We had the tomb here, but it was much deeper than that. They would deposit the bodies of the deceased in the tomb for a couple of years until all the soft tissues evaporate. You have the bones left, and you put the bones in the family ossuary, where the Bible says, I will rejoin my father's, my ancestor's bones. That's how it went. And the tomb would be used again for the next generation of the departed. So the location is right on. We're heading into Easter weekend. Right. If you can, Reuben, take us a bit through the story, once again, of the resurrection of Jesus. This tomb is empty. Right. Uh, he's not here. Take us through it a bit more. Well, just like the Bible says, he would be buried in a rich man's tomb. Joseph of yeah, Arimathea. Joseph of Arimathea. This yeah. was his family tomb. Because the Bible says it was nearly the Sabbath, there was no time for the whole uh, process of cleansing and anointing and the herbs on the body and the oils. So they did a quick job, deposited him in, and then early Sunday morning, they would come again to finish the job. And that's where we have the beautiful gospel account. Mary is here weeping and crying, saying, where have you taken my Lord? Mary Magdalene. Mary Magdalene. Of course, the Lord is alive. He's walking around in the garden. She thinks he's a stranger. She thinks he's the gardener. And she says, where have you laid my Lord? And he gives her one word. She says, Mary. She falls at his feet. She grabs a hold of his ankles. And then he gave her the most incredible line. He says, Mary, don't touch me. I haven't yet ascended to the Father. This is the God we worship, who would stop by every brokenhearted and give you a loving touch. God Almighty has a glorious future for this land, Reuben, personified yes. in the resurrection of His Son, the Lord Jesus. That's right. Before we go, there was a certain act that the Lord Jesus commanded His followers to observe in remembrance of Him. I thought it would be very special to partake in it with you right here in the garden tomb. Folks, I mentioned that Jesus instructed us to do something very specific, a very specific act, and that's why Reuven and I, as we head into Easter weekend on this Good Friday, are going to take communion together. But before we do, Reuven, we've got some powerful scriptures you'd like to share that have great relevance for this day and for this Absolutely. holiday. Absolutely. Father, let them all be one. Even as you, Father, are in me and I in you, let them be in us so that the world might believe that Thou hast sent me. I gave them the honor that You gave me, that they may be one, just like we are one, so that the world may know that the Father sent His Son. And we pray together, our Heavenly Father, our Lord Yeshua, You have commanded us to eat Your body, to drink of Your blood. We know it is a symbol, we know it is by faith, to become one with You. And whomsoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. In Yeshua's name, 
Let's take the bread, my brother. Lord Yeshua, you have commanded us to drink of your blood, the blood of the new covenant. We do it by faith. We know it is a symbol. Let us become one with Yeshua. In your name we pray. Amen. Reuven, we can't thank you enough for this very special time together, this very special Good Friday. We will see you again soon here in the land of Israel. In the meantime, happy Easter, my friend. Happy Easter. Folks, I can't express it any better than what Reuven just prayed. He is risen indeed. So from our entire team, from Reuven, the entire team here at Stackelbeck Tonight and TBN, happy Easter. God bless you, and we'll see you again soon.